The following program was produced by an independent community producer. The opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of the ECAT staff or board of directors. Good day, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. This is Bill Ames, the co-host of the uh, Film Connection. We are now in our 22nd year. Very proudly say that. Thanks to our co-host, Penelope. <laughs> what was your first name? Priscilla. Priscilla. I stand correct. <laughs> it's going to be a good show. It's, it's my nickname, yeah. Penny. Penny, Penny. And uh, we're very, uh, we specialize, as the, our viewers all know, our loyal viewers all know, that we like to get people who have worked in the media or are currently working in the media, either hopefully in Easton, but uh, even better if we can Shanghai someone from distant locations such as today. And um, thank you all for tuning in. I think we'll give you an entertaining hour. And let me kick it over to my co-host Priscilla to introduce our speaker or guest who's very kindly giving an hour of his time, valuable time. Yes, thank you, Naveed. I've known Naveed for many years. Uh, he's a very good friend uh, of uh, my son. And um, you have been working in LA and at the same time you have nurtured three teenagers. They're now teenagers. So, so you, from the time they were babies, these three kids grew up with your uh, struggles, your challenges, your successes, your wonderful uh, moments, and uh, they have all benefited from that, Naveed. Your kids are smart, they're straight-A students, um, you know, you, you, shouldn't, you, you couldn't be prouder, I know. No, I'm not. <laughs> I couldn't be prouder. They're, um, th th thanks for saying it. They're, they're super sweet kids. You might even see one of them walk in the house at some point. Uh, um, so let's yeah, I... Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, let's. So, what, ask your first question. Okay, my first question is: uh, Tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, and whether there were any influences uh, from your childhood, from your family, that put you on the path you're on. And what does he currently do? First, right? Film produ producer. Yeah. So we got to establish yeah. what he does, and then do your <coughs> thing. Okay. okay, I can. I, I can do that. Yeah. Um, so, so I am a, I've been in LA for 25 years now. Um, I'm a producer now. I what half my, half of my career, I was a studio executive, which is the financier side, you know, the buyers and sellers. And I worked at a few studios. Um, and now I've been producing mostly independently for the last 12 years. Um, I, my influences to answer Priscilla's question that my influences were, and this is where I kind of date myself a little bit and, give away my age ish. Um, when, when I was really little, my parents got divorced and my dad moved into an apartment building and I'm from Ohio. Um, so this was in Toledo and my dad moved into an apartment building where the guy next door was the first guy to have VCRs probably in all of Toledo. Um, and he not only had a whole rack of VCRs, but every night he would rent movies and he would copy them and collect the movies and he also because he was an engineer i don't know how i still don't understand how he did this but he had a way to broadcast them through throughout a small like two block radius so every night i would sit up at like six now i was probably seven years old and watch movies that i really should not have been watching including the exorcist which i watched by myself um and a whole host of other movies that i shouldn't have watched <clears throat> but that was kind of the start of it where i really got into watching movies and then um I was, I was always afraid to do something like this, you know, where your parents are like, no, you need to go get a job as an accountant or a lawyer or whatever. And, um, and then, but when I went to college in Ohio undergrad, and then while I was there, I didn't, I decided I didn't want to be an accountant. And I switched my major to study mass communication. And then I ended up going to grad school for film in Chicago. I went, I moved to Chicago um got a job in doing audio and video production. And then um, while I was there, I ended up going to grad school for film at Columbia College in Chicago. And um, that was kind of like the bridge. And while I was in film school, I ended up meeting the woman who at the time ran Jodie Foster's company. And she's now a big, big Oscar nominated writer. 
Um, and, uh, but at the, back then she was running Jody Foster's company. This was in 98. And I, I said, can I come intern for you? And she said, sure. And so I went well, that summer of 98, I came out, I spent the summer in LA, I interned, got the lay of the land, understood, got a sense of how the business worked. I didn't even know what producing meant until I had this internship. And then I got a sense of like, oh, wait, you're creative and business minded and you kind of do both. And, um, and so it was like, for me, it was the perfect fit. And then the next summer I packed up my, the, the kid's mom and I, she's not my ex, but, um, the kid's mom and I moved out here in 99 and I've been out here ever since. Mm -hmm. Well, and what about influences in your early years in your childhood from your parents or from your friends, neighbors, besides the neighbor who was next door? To you? <laughs> so, so it's, that's a really good question too. Um, so my dad, uh, my dad came from a whole, he was Irish. My, as we were talking about earlier, my dad's side was Irish. My mom's side is Iranian, um, which is a really fun combination, especially in Toledo in the seventies. Um, and, uh, and, um, my dad was a musician for the most part. He was a composer, wrote a lot of music, um, and was very artistic and his, his whole side of the family was, as a matter of fact, his mom was a pianist and played in bars. His, I can't remember if it was his grandparents, his great grandparents were on vaudeville. Um, they were in a vaudevillian act. Um, and so genetically speaking, I guess uh, there's a lot of art on that side of the family. Um, and then, um, and not, not to dismiss the Persian side, cause there's art artistic side on that as well. But, um, and then, yeah, Bill, the guy who had that apartment who has since passed by my dad and Bill both passed, but, um, they, they, there was a lot of sitting around talking about movies and a lot watching them, talking about them, talking about directors. And so early on, this was way early on, um, uh, you know, we watched the first films by like, you know, Zemeckis or Spielberg, well, all those guys that are big directors now, but when I was little, I was watching their, you know, first films, um, and, uh, and getting a sense of it and storytelling. And, and it was a little bit, it was a little bit more raw. I feel like back then than it is now, I feel like now you see storytelling and on your phone, you see it everywhere, right? Everything's telling stories in some way. Um, but it was, it was a little bit more specialized. And then when I was in college, I was, I was like, all I want to do is get a job in a movie theater. So I did, I was a usher in a movie theater and um, I watched every movie that came out, every movie, it doesn't matter how bad it was. I watched them all. That's a good way to do it. Um, yeah. I lived in a Harvard, near Harvard Square and uh, I used to go to different locations to go to movies in the Boston area. This is like in the 1980s. So I decided that I make a commitment to go to every movie at the Harvard Square Movie Theater. And I, I think over 15 years, I missed three. And it was amazing how many movies that, you know, if I hadn't done that, I never would have gone to them. If I'd read the review or whatever, I would have said, no way, Jose, am I going to that movie? <laughs> but because I had to go tr three movies on a Saturday to keep up with my schedule, yeah, I sort of do it. And I was known as, okay, the, as the, the, the Refreshment saying, okay, here comes medium Coke, buttered popcorn, small. That was my nickname, the theater. <laughs> <laughs> they they got funny. used to me coming. But total immersion, which is really the point, is a uh, big, um, big way to go. I mean, you mm -hmm. have to sort of get in and see the good, the bad, and the ugly, mm -hmm. no pun intended, uh, to really yeah. absorb <clears throat> what it's about. So, so yeah, and I. I can, well, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I can actually add to that because um, in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, I went to live with my mom in another town. She had moved, and they took away the TV because I was obviously addicted to TV. And they took away the TV, and for so for that three years, all of a sudden, I discovered the only other medium I could, which was books, um, and I started reading. I, I was really into sci-fi and fantasy and and that kind of stuff, and I read. I mean, you name it. Asimov and all those guys. I read pff, I, most of the books so that by, and I would sit there during school and have, pretend to have my textbook open and just sit there reading all these other books, you know? Um, and then that, that eventually evolved into, I guess not, I shouldn't say better, but like, you know, other literature. And I, I ended up reading, I mean, now I just thought about this the other day. Now I look back and I've read 
a lot, right? Like a lot of the old classic literature. I ended up, when I was an undergrad, when I was switching majors, I ended up taking every lit class there was at the school, all the British lits, all the American lits, um, and ended up reading a ton of stuff. So I guess that was another big influence for me too. Yeah, I think that's that's the only way you can do it. You can't be too selective. In these no. So have you written them? You've obviously written some movie scripts in your day. No, I mean, I, I technically I have. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm more of a producer, and uh, and I, I so here's here's my stab at, at being a little bit more creative. I have I have written something that I actually got paid to write. Um, but it was a pitch based on an idea. So when I split up with my ex, I moved in with a guy and we lived on the beach in the marina. So we, our place overlooked the ocean and we both were going through divorces. And, uh, and, and we had the kids together, we coordinated, so we had the kids together on a weekend. And then he, uh, it, so one weekend it was love and teddy bears. And then the next weekend it was complete debauchery. And so I pitched that as a, as a TV show, I do it turned out into an animated thing. I ended, I wrote that. I've since started a novel that's actually really good. I just haven't had time to work on it or finish it. Um, that's that comes from like a movie idea. And then I've started dabbling and writing some other stuff. But the thing that I want to do um, is I have a script that I'm developing with another guy who's writing it that I want to direct. Because um, I've always had a passion for directing. I just was always afraid to take the leap and do it. And this is a very, this idea for this movie is a very personal one. Um, it's commercial, but it's very personal. So I think sometime later this year that could happen because it's not an expensive movie. It wouldn't be hard to put together. And um, Naveed, what's the name of your company? So funny. Um, uh, when, I, when I was still an executive, um, before I had a company, um, uh, a bunch of us sat around talking about different company names. I think it was your son who came up with the name for mine um, because he liked the idea of Vandal. My company name is Vandal Entertainment. And he had said that. And I was like, wait, I like that name. And I had a whole idea for like the logo and everything else. So I ended up saying, do you guys care if I take that name? And then they had other ones for theirs. And uh, I ended up taking that. So my company name is Vandal. Like in vandalizing? (laughs) Yes. My logo, my logo, which I'm what? I might oh. have here somewhere, but my logo is a guy spray painting uh, the name Vandal on a wall. Not like the Visigoths. Weren't there Vandals and Visigoths? And... Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, what are we going to ask him next? Well, I, I'm just wondering uh, about some of the, <clears throat> your, your proudest moments. Now, it doesn't have to be, <laughs> the, the, it doesn't have to be the, you know, the success of, of a film that you started from scratch and, um, you know, until it came out, but it can be just in the journey. What was some of your proudest moments? <clears throat> Besides my kids. Um, yes. So, because uh, <laughs> that's an obvious one. Um, I think... I mean, I've had some, I've had some really proud moments, but honestly, and it's not necessarily that they got made into a movie or not. um, The proud moment was when something fortuitous really happens through effort and hard work, because this whole business, there's obviously there's a lot of hard work that happens, but most of the time when you get, everyone hears about something in the business, it's all timing and luck. Most of it, most of it's timing and luck. And I'll give you a couple examples. Um, So I, had this is just one and and by the way my version of it never got made but i had one moment which i I always find this fascinating i had one moment where um there was a book that had gone around in hollywood called gray man which last year was made into a movie and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna voice my opinion of it because i'm friends with the directors um but there was a movie that was on netflix called gray man it was i don't know 250 300 million dollar movie there's a book that had gone around Hollywood that was Gray Man. It was the original source material for that movie. And I got the book. Um, I knew there was something in the book that was really compelling and interesting. I actually gave it to a friend of mine who's a pretty well-known writer. And I asked him to read it. And he said, I know what's missing. And he said, um, it's missing this personal connection. And if you saw the movie, I won't bore you guys into the details, but it's about a hit, the world's greatest hitman, And everyone's trying to kill him. And so they kidnap his handler, the old guy who manages his career, and the handler's daughter and grandkids to draw him out. 
And, and this writer came up with the idea. He's like, why don't you make it so that years ago he had had an affair with the handler's daughter and no one ever knows about, knew about it, including the handler, but the, the, the kids are his and, and the bad guys at some point in the middle of the movie find out. And I was like, that's a great idea. So um, we ended up hiring, we optioned the book, we hired that writer. Um, and this is the problem. The problem was we developed a script. The script is awesome. It was so good, um, much better in the movie. And um, and the uh, and we sent it to CAA, which is one of the, the biggest agencies in Hollywood. We sent it to CAA, and we sent it to them for director ideas. We wanted to get a director on it. And uh, two weeks two weeks go by, and someone from the talent department calls and says, "Hey, uh, what's going on with that script? What are you guys doing with it?" And we're like, "We we sent it to the direct the lit department to get a director. Why?" And they're like, "Well, we sent it to Brad Pitt, and he wants to do it." <laughs> Which, which the reason why I find that so funny is that never, ever happens in Hollywood. If you want to send something to an actor, you either have to have an inside track into them personally, or you have to make a cash offer to them. And, um, and they just, one of the assistants at CAA took it upon himself to send it over to Brad Pitt's company. Anyways, we developed it with Brad Pitt and, uh, and we were really close to getting it made. There's a lot of great stories that happen along the way. And then as what happens in Hollywood, which happens all the time in Hollywood, frankly, which is why I left the studio world, um, my boss got fired and a new studio head came in. And because it was part of the regime of, or part of the previous regime, he unraveled the whole movie and turned it into something different. And then it went away. The book ended up going to Sony and they developed it with Charlize Theron for a minute. And then it went from Sony to eventually Netflix, which is the movie that got made. But that moment was a proud moment because it was something where it was a book that everyone liked. No one knew what to do with. And we had this moment. It was like almost perfect timing and almost almost had a big Brad Pitt franchise. Uh, and then it fell apart. Um, one other quick one. And by the way, that story, the the ups and downs and the great moments and the happiness of getting Brad Pitt and then everything collapsing around you and getting everybody getting fired. That's way more common in Hollywood than the, the opposite. Um, but another great moment was when I was actually at silver working with Joel, um, we were developing the dirty dozen, a remake of the dirty dozen. And um, Joel my old boss said, I want Guy Ritchie to direct it. And this was when, this was before Guy had a resurgence in his career. It was kind of, he was still married to Madonna and his career was not in a great place. And, um, and uh, I said, okay, so we sent it to Guy. Guy came in, had some ideas and wanted to, to, um, to do it. And then he called, Guy called me up and goes, look, this is going to take a while to rewrite it the way I want to do it. In the meantime, I have this other movie that um, I, want to get financed would you guys be interested in doing it and he sent it to me and it was a script called rock and Rolla, which um which I, um we ended up i read it that night and the next day joel greenlit it because we had financing to be able to make that movie um and he greenlit it the next day not having even read it and um and we and that movie got made and that's another like weird timing in that case it was i guess more of a success story because it got made um and, it, and it's, I guess, a proud moment because it's a really good film and it was really fun to be a part of it and see Guy. And then there's so many people in that movie that became big, huge movie stars that at the time no one had ever heard of, including Tom Hardy and um, Jerry Butler was in it and Idris Elba. Like all these guys at the time, no one really knew who they were, but now they're big stars. So that was a proud moment too, I think, and, and probably more of a positive one. <clears throat> Well, how has uh, social media changed things in your world? I mean, I think it's everyone sort of on it, but is there you have a particular take on it? Um, yes and no. I don't look I, for me. I don't know if it's social media that has, I'm as afraid of as much as it is AI. Um, but yes, yeah, social social media has affected us in some ways. So let me back up for a second. I teach a class at USC. I teach two, but one of them is the business of Hollywood. And in that class, one of the things I put at the students is that at the beginning of the semester is look at how things are changing in the business and try to be ahead of the curve. Because there's been times in my career, including a very comical story of when I went upstairs, this one company I worked at, I went upstairs to this office of the small little company called Netflix. And, uh, and I met with them and they were like, you should bring us TV shows. And I was like, why would I bring TV shows? They mail people DVDs. And then that little office at Netflix became 
the whole building and then eventually moved in to become what Netflix became. And the reason why I tell that story and I tell it to the students is that was 12 years ago this month. That was 12 years ago that I went into this little office called Netflix and said, why would I work with this little office, this little company? And, um, and I was short-sighted, obviously. <laughs> and six months after that or eight months after that, House of Cards came out on their streaming service. And then we all know the rest, right? We all know the rest of the, the history. So the thing I put to my students is look at what's changing and it's changing fast. It's what, what the, I teach the first day I teach that class, I teach the history of it, like where the, where the business went from a hundred years ago to home entertainment, starting like how I started talking about this in the, in the eighties, you know, with home entertainment, the late 70s, early eighties, um, how home entertainment changed it, what that meant for the movie business and different phases along the way where everybody thought the movie business was over, you know, when TV was invented, everybody thought movies were going to be done. Um, and how they weren't, but looking at like, okay, what is the way to incorporate those changes into what we do or looking ahead at what, for example, Netflix and what that could be and what that could mean for you. So as far as social media goes, the one thing that's happening, especially with social media and especially with things like YouTube, there's a, there is a democratization of things happening in the business. So for example, you used to have to shoot on film, which was very, very expensive. And that's why most, you know, kids in high school couldn't go make a film because you had to pay for film and development and all that stuff. That changed obviously with video cameras and the quality of video cameras. Now that got cheaper and easier to make. Um, another big hurdle in Hollywood and filmmaking is distribution. And you've seen the, how, you know, it's only been studios who could release stuff in movie theaters and everything went through movie studios. And then even, this last summer, you saw how Taylor Swift went right to the movie theaters and said, I'm going to release this directly to you. And, um, and I, you know, and I want a bigger cut of ticket sales. So because it didn't go through movie studios, and she made a lot more money that way. The same kind of thing is happening um, through digital platforms, YouTube, um, and that's going to continue to evolve and change. And then back to my other point, AI, um, AI scares me, because Last week, I don't know if you guys saw it, but they announced text to video and the quality of the video that AI created was incredible. Text and to video. Wow. Yeah. So, so you you so you type in um you type in something like and if you Google it, you'll see it. You type in the the really good one was um I forget what kind of dogs they were, little cute puppy like golden retriever puppies playing in the snow. That's what they typed in. And it create the AI created a video that looks really, really, really realistic of golden retriever puppies playing in the snow. And they, they did a whole series of them. And as a matter of fact, it's so good that a couple things happen almost immediately. One, there's a big producer, writer, director in Atlanta who's building an eight hundred million dollar studio facility. And that day he announced he was shutting it down because that, you know, when you have the ability to do something on a computer, you don't need a studio, right? You can use that and replace visual effects with it. So, um, and, and they announced that they're not even releasing that um, program to the public yet because it's a, an election year and they're already afraid of what that kind of ability to create authentic, realistic looking videos do in this country. So, I mean, that's a whole other scary topic, but as far as, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's a uh, very, uh, very interesting that you say all that. Cause I mean, when you're, you're writing your novel, you said you're writing a novel. I mean, you've got AI right, right next to you. And you know, if you're looking for Don't settings for a scene or something, you've got a first draft of a scene. Um, yeah. Don't think I haven't thought of it. I've thought about it cause I've written the first third of it. And I've outlined some of the rest. I've thought about just plugging in an AI and having it spit out the rest of the book for me. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to, but I've thought about it. It'd probably make it easier. Um, it is at the end of the day, it's about entertaining a person like me, right? Yes. And if you're the yes. one that turns your computer on, goes to chat, and enters all the data and all the context, and says, "Let's see, let's see what comes out." I mean. It, that's the new normal. Yeah. That's going to be the new normal. It, it, it is, as a matter of fact. I've used it a bunch myself, so my limited thing. But I was just, 
the things that came out, I was just, I was astounded how good it was, you know, and I just entered the context mm -hmm. for what, what came out, but the, all the metaphors and this sort of thing that just, it was, I entered nothing about them and suddenly it was these high-end metaphors about, you know, the good, the bad, and all this sort of stuff. I guess they Google, they Google, they went to a lot of books that Google had scanned, right? And that somehow that ends up in the SI, in the AI pot, as I understand it. And uh, do you understand how AI works in terms of a little bit, neuro, a little the, bit. Next, the next word and the next word is, it's very interesting. I, I read something about it. And so the, the word farm comes up, there's the probabilities that it's going to be a farm tractor or a farm girl or a farm this and somehow AI can track where it's going and it flips in. You know, this is a tractor. He's going to be told. So I don't know. But yeah, it, um, the thing with AI is it's evolving and it's evolving exponentially fast. Um, I when when Sora Sarah Sora when that text to video thing got announced last week, there was a there was a video that some guy put out, and it was it was less than a year ago when there was this AI generated video. It's, I think someone typed in Will Smith eating spaghetti and it looked really bad because his hands didn't look real. It didn't look like Will Smith at all. The spaghetti didn't look real. Nothing looked real in the video, but that was less than a year ago. And already you can put in puppies, you know, golden retriever puppies, and it looks like golden retriever puppies, right? Already. And that's less than a year. I have a friend who's developing AI software um, that can not only read a script and give you comments and thoughts on it and a synopsis of it. Um, uh, but also it, it can now write a script, not very well yet, but it soon it can write a script for him. And as he's typing and writing a script, he has this program and he's created this AI software that will take the script, budget it, schedule it, create um, previs for it, storyboard it. It will uh, create pitch decks, which are like, you know, images that, help you sell the movie and it'll do all that stuff pretty soon i think it's going to get to the point where you just type in you tell an idea and it'll create a movie for you um look whether or not it'll be good it's probably still five six years off but it's going to happen and it's going to happen pretty fast i think that's that's the part for me that's scary not social yeah, media at least you've got a first draft of something you know that you can yeah. you can work on and uh, so that's what the writer's strike was all about right is what you just described it, yeah, a big part of it was AI. A big part of it was AI, and um, obviously a lot of it was financial. Um, uh, but I think there's a lot of fear in and around this business um, of what it's going to do. It's already affecting a lot. I heard yesterday, I have a friend that has built, had over for the last 25 years, built a company that creates movie posters. And his company's in a lot of trouble because AI is creating movie posters quicker and free. Um, and, and stuff like that's happening all over the business. Um, so, yeah. Well, it's going to be interesting to look back in three or four years as to, you know, the, as you say, yeah. it's an exponential situation. It's not now, do you think that AI is going to substitute for screenwriters that there won't be a screenwriter position in the future? Um, I don't, I mean, look down the road someday, I think look, we're probably all going to be replaced by robots, um, I, down the road someday that could happen for now. The technology is not there yet. Like it doesn't, it, it, because it, uh, Bill, you were talking about this a second ago, AI takes, it learns from everything else out there. Right. So it's learning from how other things are done and basically is mimicking it. So it's like, you know, you can, it, it, it knows like, if, you know, for, as an example, it knows like, okay, well, if you're going to have a serial killer movie, here's the best weapons that work, at, you know, in all these movies, here's the best ones that they use. You should use, the killer should have that weapon. And then it extrapolates all of this information from everything prior to it and creates its own thing. But it doesn't, there's, there's a lack of originality there. And there's a lack of, so far, there's a lack of the quality check, um, cause it's still, at least from writing, it still isn't great. Um, but down the road, 
um, there's already people who are doing what Bill alluded to, which is like plugging something in and having it spit out like an outline or whatever. And then you can work from it, right? You like, you take that and you go, Oh, well, what if I do this here? There's still a big human component that's needed. Um, it, but well, I'll be honest. Yeah. It's scary. I don't know what's going to happen, um, down the road. Well, it's hard to even um, come up with an analogy that this is, here's something that happened in the past that's somewhat analogous to what's happening now. I mean, I, I racked my brain trying to come up with it. The only, the only thing I've heard, and it's, and it's, you're right, it's not analogous. The only thing I've heard is when they compared it to like, oh, um, when the steam engine was invented, then it got rid of all these other jobs, right? Or I forget, there was another one where it was like um, pouring concrete versus some other way that buildings were made. Yeah. Um, you know, like that kind of thing, where it's like, well, you get rid of everyone that knew how to do it this way because now it's done this way. Um, and, uh, but this is, AI is just, it, it's, it's going to affect a lot of businesses quickly. It's and mental. like movie posters. And, and it's mental. It's, I mean, the examples you're showing are physical, you know, uh, yeah. this disruptors. Mm. This is a disruptor of our minds, <laughs> you know, which uh, it's exciting, certainly. Mm. But uh, So uh, tell me, Naveed, where do you get your ideas? Do you get them from current affairs, the newspapers, books, uh, a comment that somebody says to you? Um, or, or do you also parlay your ideas from other people's ideas, other movies. Um, I mean, some people get their ideas from comic books. I mean. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, that's a really good question. Um, so it's funny too, because if you've been doing this long enough, everything sort of becomes second nature, right? So like when you come up with an idea, you kind of forget about the fact that, I, I guess kind of like AI, you kind of forget about the fact that this is like, all the experiences along the way that you've had, all the great scripts you've read, you know, all like the great writers who've come up with characters doing a certain type of thing, whatever. Um, I, to, to, when, when I come up with an idea or we come up with ideas, by and large, the simplest way to break it down is we go, oh, it's kind of like if you took this meets this, right? Um, or like, so, I mean, I'll pick on Eric a little bit. Um, there was two scripts he wrote recently. One of them, War on Christmas, started as we were sitting around talking about, we literally were sitting around talking about like, okay, the movie Christmas Vacation, right? With the, the National Olympians Christmas Vacation. How do we take, and, and we come from an action or an action comedy background. So we were like, how do you take that comedic, very funny holiday movie, but turn it into an action movie? We're like a family's around the house for the holidays, but bad guys attack the house. That, that was like an idea we had. And then he had the idea of, you know, guy comes home for the holidays to visit mom and mom has a new boyfriend who's like Liam Neeson, who ironically is who we're out to right now. So fingers crossed, but, um, and Liam Neeson, uh, he seems like a really nice guy, but he doesn't trust him. So he takes a photo of him. He sends it to the local town in Boston where you guys all live, sends it to that, uh, that, that town cop who he went to high school with. And that guy runs it through the system and it comes back squeaky clean. But in fact, the Liam Neeson character, mom's boyfriend used to be a spy and he's in hiding and his actions just caused the bad guys to find out where he is. And they, the bad guys show up as the family from Christmas vacation does too. You know, the, the funny grandparents and the, I'm, I'm not going to say everything because it's all, all your relatives. Um, <laughs> but, but that was how that idea originated. It was literally us sitting around going, let's do Christmas vacation, but bad guys attack a house. Right. Or another one was um, let's do the big Lebowski meets John wick. You know, and by the way, most of our movies, honestly, most of our movies are all something meets John wick and John wick's a great paradigm because of what it is. Um, but it, but the Big Lebowski meets John Wick is a funny one because the Big Lebowski, I don't know if you know it, but it's, it's, you know, it's a comedy about a pothead, right? The guy smokes a lot of pot and that's all he does. And so marrying the two of them ended up actually being a very original idea in a very, very well executed way as he did. Um, but a lot of our ideas come from that. Um, back to my point, I'm sorry, I'm rambling again, back to my point about, um, uh, having experience in the business, we also know when we hear an idea, if it's something that we can sell or make. 
Um, so it's, it's much easier for someone to go, what if it's this, or, you know, it's father, daughter, we're making a movie about a father and daughter stuck on the side of a cliff, you know, where everything goes wrong. He's trying to repair his relationship with his daughter. who he hasn't seen in a few years and mom's died and they're doing this thing and everything goes wrong on the side of the cliff. We're, we're going to make that movie this fall. Um, so we hear an idea and, and, and then it's about how well is it executed? Because we know when an idea is a good idea. And there's a lot of other elements, again, that goes along with being, having done this for a while, where you hear an idea and then you go, well, actually that idea is a $400 million movie and we just can't make that movie. But that there's an idea, father, daughter stuck on the side of the cliff is a good idea because it's contained and we know that we can do visual effects and set extensions and whatever and keep it all in one place and it won't be that expensive to make, right? So then it's about budget, idea, execution of the script is it good and then we go get a director and then we cast it and find a financier so you, what is your major contribution uh to the to the movie business are you the financial guy are you the uh, what's my superpower yes what's your superpower i mean i think from what i understand because i've known you for a while uh is that you you really have made wonderful connections and nurtured relationships that matter in Hollywood. So, um, and, and that brings you to the money people. And so are, are you more the strategist um, than the creative uh, person? Uh, or are you a little bit of both? Is, is your strong point the strategy, the relationships, getting the money? And, and then you're also really good, I know, at um, making up what people in Hollywood call notes when they're looking at a script. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's funny. And you're really, yeah. good at, really good at that, you know, looking with a critical eye as to what's possible, what will sell, what makes sense in the, in the uh, succession of events in a, in a, in a sh uh, screenplay, right? Yeah. 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 That's, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, it's, it's funny, this came up just the other day. Uh, oh, I know what it was. Um, I was at the Producers Guild brunch where they had all the Oscar nominated producers, including some celebrities up on the stage. And, the, and one of them asked, what's your superpower as a producer? Um, and funny enough, Bradley Cooper said, my superpower is I handle the crazy director because he directed the movie as well as produced it. Um, so my, I, y yes, you're spot on. My superpower is um, I learned early, early on that, and I tell this to my students too, I learned early on that this business is 90% who you know. And again, it's a lot of luck, a lot of timing, but it's a lot of who you know. Um, I, 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 early on in my career, this was, I was still an assistant at one of the agencies. Um, I was an assistant and I made this point that anybody that called to talk to my boss, you know, the other assistants, I would try to figure out a way to get to meet them for a coffee or a drink or whatever. And, and I tried to build this network of people, one at every studio, and then eventually one at every production company. So I had this massive network of assistants all around town that I, that I became friends with. And another thing I tell young people who are coming to the business, it, it, you don't have to try to meet the head of Warner Brothers um, as, a, as an assistant because soon enough, all of those people that you met, yeah, some of them are going to move out of the business, but is, a lot of those people that you meet come up the ranks with you to the point that there was a time when I used to, when I was a young um, executive in the business, we had a dinner where we picked one person from every studio Universal, Warner Brothers, whatever. And I was a studio exec. So we had one person from every studio and we had this dinner like every couple months. And most of those guys went on to run the studio that they worked at or another studio. The most of those guys became heads of Warner Brothers and Universal and like all those places. And they're still really good friends of mine. Very, very good friends of mine. Um, so I did that early on and, and I, and, and I did other tricks, you know, to help like every year back to the kids every year, I would take the quotes that my kids said that year and I put it into a little holiday card, you know, the things, stuff my kids said this year. And, uh, and I emailed it to everybody in my contact list and everyone thought it was super cute and funny. So I had this little shtick and everybody's like, Oh, no, he's a sweet guy. Cause he's got three kids. And he loves his kids. And you know, he's also a nice guy and he's a good producer. 
Well, Navi, um, I know I, you're still doing it. I got your Christmas card. <laughs> I know she got my card. <laughs> and, but what you're not telling, it's not just what your kids say, it's your comments that you make on what your kids say, right? <laughs> and some of them are not, what? and some of them we cannot, we cannot just uh, pronounce on this show. <laughs> no, I'm getting a little red. I'm getting a little red in the face because some of them you can't repeat. Um, and by the way, now my kids are old enough that they say those highly inappropriate things, and uh, and it's ass. Yes. Uh, so I still do that. Um, but but I um, but it's all part of the networking thing, or you know, being in people's at least once a year. Everybody goes, oh, I see what Navid's up to. That's great, you know. And um, and then. So that, that is probably my biggest strength is knowing everyone in town. As a matter of fact, I do some consulting for other companies and anytime they need something, I'm like, oh, I know, I know the person I'll call them, you know, and, and they all just kind of laugh because I, anytime someone comes up, it's someone I know. Um, but, but there's a lot of other stuff to it. So um, when I left the studio world um, and I went to be an independent producer, independent producing is completely different set of finance rules and everything else completely different than studio financing it's completely different so much so that i had been doing it for about six months and my old boss who was the who had been a chairman of a studio he'd been a chairman of the studio my old boss called me up and he goes and he brought me in he goes can you explain all this to me like how does this work exactly um because it, they don't they don't ever really understand what that part of it is and i actually teach this in my class the business of it, which is to answer your question, another one of my strengths, the business side of it and like how things are financed, especially independently and how why. I actually just taught it yesterday. Um, I, I teach them about independent foreign sales based financing versus studio financing and now what streamers do because that's also a completely different model. Um, and so that's something that I've gotten to understand. And I still have friends who call me up and go, can you help me get a better understanding of a certain element to it? Um, so those are like probably my two biggest, but in, and again, back to what we were just talking about in doing so in, in knowing how to finance and do all this stuff. I also know what kinds of movies are easier to get made in the indie space, you know? Um, so that's what we spend most of our time developing are things that I know that we can probably get made outside of the studio system. Have you ever had uh, a, an idea and, and read a script that was just magnificent and, and, and you'd say, oh, there's no way that this isn't going to get made, and then it doesn't? Yeah, yeah, there, that's definitely happened. Um, and ironically, my favorite script of all time um, and, and when I, it was, it was on the blacklist, which is the list of like the best scripts of the year. I had read it. Um, and no one, no one is yet to be able to get a director. I went to so many directors on that movie when I was producing it, I went to so many directors and I still love that script. I was so passionate about that script so much so that I keep swearing that if I get this first movie made and I'm good at it, the one that I want to direct that I want to be able to go back and direct this other script because it's brilliant the problem with it is and i know you might ask this question the problem with that script is it's a very difficult script to get made not because of financials or anything else but because it's eight different love stories and they're all interconnected um and there is a main character in it but it but it, because it's so episodic in its nature everyone that reads it goes oh you should make it into a tv show and make each one of them a uh, you know, like a love story. Ironically, I produced Modern Love, <laughs> the TV show, which was that, which was a bunch of different love stories that at the end we connected them all. But, but this is like, this has a sci-fi element to it. And it's, and it's just, honestly, it's just, and I still get people, agents who call me up and go, this is the best script I've ever read. Um, and it breaks my heart that hasn't been made yet. Ironically, the last time I talked to the writer, he's in the boat that I just described in which he's off directing his first film. And if that's successful, he wants to direct the script. And I just, I dream about being a part of it, but it's really, there are scripts that are hard to make because they're not the straightforward down the middle, the kinds of movies that we develop. They're not the, you know, action, action, comedy, comedy, thriller, you know, horror movies. They're not the straight down the middle ideas that are so obvious and easy. It's really hard to get all the other ones made. Mm. So what are, uh, what are some of the films you've seen, um, 
I, uh, big success around here is uh, American Fiction, mm -hmm. which uh, mm -hmm. is I don't know where that is. I don't know if that's an Oscar nominee. Or was I? It is. Yeah. This picture. And that's yeah. that's revived the movie industry here in, in some theaters that have sort of because uh, it, it got big on um, Facebook. People who went to it loves to write it up because it, it was a, mm -hmm. such a topical, you know, all about the woke thing and all that sort of stuff. And, <laughs> you know, yeah, I know. It really went to town on that. So have you seen it? You must have seen it. I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. I liked it. I liked it a lot. It was really well done. I think. I think part of the the plus to it is it's a very, you're right. It is very topical and it also does take all the conversations that everybody having and kind of turns it on their head a little bit. Um, it's, and it's well done. It's really well acted. Um, and it's, a, and I think it's just because it's a really original idea. It was based on a book. Um, I've, I've seen not all of the movies nominated, but most of them. Um, I, there's some that I just think are amazing because of their craft. Uh, I'm not recommending the two of you necessarily watch Saltburn, especially not you, Priscilla. Um, uh, but, it, but but the craft of it was beautiful and really well executed, and it's a really engaging movie. Um, but and then there are other movies that I don't really understand why they're nominated. Um, but um, I think it was a pretty good year this last year in terms of artistic quality. Um, Oppenheimer's going to win. Um, yeah, that and, was, and I think that was uh -huh. a huge, that was also huge here. I mean, it ran for weeks in some theaters. Yeah. Now what, what, yeah, I guess, well, it does an invention of the atom bomb and the communist element and all that. It doesn't get more, um, sort of, uh, hardwired into people who study history in world war two. I mean, it's, it's right up there, but, uh, uh, I don't think that, do you think there'll be many more like that, that, that can go for three and a half hours? And, uh, I don't, I don't know. Every time somebody complains about the length of movies, they just keep getting longer. Yeah, no, I know it's I, a good movie. I don't mind a good movie that's four, four, uh, four hours long. What else? I don't either. Going to go work out or something, you know? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't either. The length. The length doesn't necessarily bother me as long as they're engaging and well yeah. done. Um, uh, yeah, and they and they do seem to be getting longer. Um, I mean, look, Nolan is arguably the best director of our generation, and he's definitely going to win. Um, it's the it's the craftspeople and the storytellers who are. I think I, I, back to our earlier conversation, I think part of the reason why these movies are getting so much notoriety and so much attention is there's a lot of crap made on the streamers because they're made for as massive an audience as you can. And they're pandering to the lowest common denominator. And it's like, you know, whether it's something that's a big giant expensive movie with movie stars in it, to, you know, like a little romantic comedy, that's just, you know, a really cute idea that's fun and cute and whatever made for that audience and everything in between it's it's i think the movies that stand out and do something totally unique and different that people aren't seeing all the time there's certain directors that do that a lot the guy who did poor things yorgos lanthimos does that all of his movies are completely bananas and you know completely different than what you would ever see on a streamer no streamer would ever make any of his movies um, but it's nominated for best picture um, and I, I think that trend's probably going to continue. It's going to be the movies that are really unique and different and stand out and tell a different way of telling it. Even Barbie did something totally different. I was just thinking about Barbie. Yeah. That, what do you, I mean, I think we've all, you've, you've seen Barbie. I did. I mean, I was fascinated by it. I didn't <laughs> make it all the way through. But, I didn't like it. But, uh. <laughs> Wait, why didn't you like it though? I, I thought it was well, so, I, was, I, I didn't like it because I thought it was so phony. It, uh, that's all. It was just, it was a real pretend. I mean, I, that's the point. I know. That was the point. But yeah. I didn't like it. Yeah. I thought yeah, that's right. it was like, let's push this as far as we can because they'll buy it. You know, it was like Hollywood yeah. showing, it was like mm -hmm. Hollywood showing off, you know, and they, they right. pulled it off. I mean, it's mm. a billion dollars. Well, my, my seven year old granddaughter loved it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, it's. Yeah. It, it, it does have. 
it does, I think it has really good messaging. It has really good, especially for girls, it has really good messaging. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and, but the point with Barbie was that it did something totally different yeah. than, mm. than what anyone, and no one else would have made Barbie that way. Nobody. Right. Um, and what was it, the special it, effects? Excuse me. Why, why did it look so different? It almost had an animation look to it, but it, it wasn't. They did that on purpose because of Barbie. They did it on purpose. It, made, it had to be this fake Barbie world because that's what Barbie is. But then they're contrasting what, what kids play with and what they're used to and what they've been, grown to be identified as in terms of like beauty and sexuality and all that stuff. And they're making a commentary about that compared to what we are living and how it's influenced it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what you mentioned Bradley Cooper, he's he's up he was a I saw a movie that he was in or directed or both, right? What was the name of it? It's Ma Maestro. Maestro, right. Mm -hmm. Leonard Leonard Bern was he did he play Leonard Bernstein in that thing? He okay. did. Yep. Amazing. He did. He he wrote it, directed it, starred in it, produced it, um, and he did a really good job. Yeah. Um I I I Look, honestly, I, I think the movie is, in terms of work of art, is brilliant. I just got a little bit bored in it, but it's really beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I grew up with him uh, the Saturday morning, remember, mm -hmm. music with the New York Philharmonic? Yeah, right. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it, was, uh, it was pretty astounding. Do you think, uh, Nivi, that there'll be more movies about individuals like Oppenheimer, Maestro, you know, Leonard Bernstein? Um, you know, is it going to be a movie someday about Spielberg? <laughs> there already was. He made it. About the himself? Fable, the, yeah, he made The Fablemans last year. That was about him. Really? Um, that was, it was about his childhood. Yeah, it's great. It's great. And and a lot of in it, a lot of the stuff in that movie that you wouldn't thought of as being true is true. Okay, and what was the um, name of the movie? The Fablemans. Oh, yes. Right. Yeah, it was about his childhood. Oh, no kidding. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's great. If you're a movie buff at all and you know Spielberg's movies, you have to watch that movie. Mm. Yeah. Because you see all the influences. And then the personal story, the scene with his mom, the scenes are they're amazing. Um, and it, all true. Um, yeah. I, will there be more biopics? Yes. Um, because there's so many stories to tell about a lot of people. But will they be done well? I don't know. I mean... Look at this last year alone. The Bob Bob Marley finally has story told, and it's a huge box office success right now. There's two different movies about Elvis in the past 14 months. You know, there was Elvis last year, and then there was Your Namesake Priscilla this year. Um, and and look, there there's going to be other Elvis movies too. There will there just will be right. Um, and there's all there's always going to be stories to tell. I think the ones I, I I'm I'm actually I'm actually developing a biopic. Um, uh, with and in i think it's really great um a buddy of mine and i had uh had this idea to you know start a way to make movies for that would inspire our daughters and um we optioned a book called the match and it's about um a black woman in the 50s and a jewish woman in the 50s who nobody would play with them in part as partners in tennis and they teamed up to play together and they won wimbledon and um and then the the black one eventually went on as a single uh, tennis player to win Wimbledon the next year, um, and so that I think that movie is going to get made. Um, there's a lot of compelling stories right now. It's just whether or not they get done well, you know, or that in a way that people care and want to go yeah. see, you know. I I uh, can saw this weekend the one with C.S. Lewis and Sigmund Freud, the um, Freud's last appointment or last session. Oh, I forgot about that. Did you see it? Yeah, I did. It was uh, pretty impressive. I mean, it just it built, you know, the first third, you wonder where's this thing going, you know, and they yeah. kept keep notching it up. And uh, finally, at the end, it's very, you know, it's very moving besides the usual sort of, it doesn't go too deeply into the Freudian thing. It talks about his, his family and his daughter. And yeah, that's, 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 I think that will do very well. I, I don't think it's eligible for Oscars. I think it's uh, just released. I think. Oh, yeah. uh, then yeah. If if it were to happen to me next year, then um, yeah, I forgot about that. That was coming out. That's the other problem right now in the business. There's so much content. It's hard to yeah. 
you know, there's yeah. there's as many good TV shows getting made um, on TV as there are movies. And so sometimes I find myself, it's really hard to get me to go to the theater anymore. I, I'm just as interested in seeing home to watch some great TV show that's, you know, eight hours of, it's, a, it's like an eight hour movie. So tell yeah. us more about the Academy Awards. Who nominates these films? What body of people nominates a film for award? And who elects um, it, chooses them? It, I, I only know a little bit more about this recently because uh, they were interviewing the guy that wrote the book about it on NPR yesterday morning. Um, <laughs> um, That's good enough. Uh, it's, the, it's the Academy. The Academy does it. And the Academy largely consists of really old white guys who <laughs> yeah. have, built, have built their careers, um, but in all different facets. So, and obviously they're going to be older because, um, you know, it's people who have built a certain pedigree in, in what they do, whether it's editors, cinematographers, sure. executives, directors, whatever, um, actors. Um, and, and it's people in the Academy um, who do it and they vote on um they i think if i remember right they they vote on best picture and all the other categories but to vote for best documentary some of the other categories i think you have to prove that you've seen them like best foreign film i think you have to prove that you've actually seen them all i think um but the members of the academy are you know the ones who do that there's different groups that vote on different things so i'm i'm in the producers guild i'm not in the academy yet um, but I'm in the Producers Guild, and um, I voted for the PGA Awards, which happened. I think I think they happened this last. Yeah, they happened this last weekend. Um, and SAG happened, which is the Screen Actors Writers Guild, Directors. All those awards, are, those are just that group. Well, Nevin, uh, sadly, we're getting the word from the control room that we're down to three minutes. But this has been as interesting as we've ever seen. I would. <laughs> oh, how about that? <laughs> You're going to have to have me back. We'd love to do that. And any of your pals, you know, who, who would be willing to give up an hour to talk to some local Easterners. And okay. Would be, we'd be thrilled. Anyway. <laughs> but get you back. Nevi, <laughs> there's one thing I wanted to ask, but we'll save it maybe for next time. But think about it. You know, what are your future goals, you know, um, besides making great movies? Uh, do, do you have In any- one minute. He's in one minute. Yeah. You, here's, here's, my, here's my one minute answer because I'm getting older. Make enough money so that I can retire. There you go. House in mind. <laughs> right. right. At, so, this point, at this point, it's making, making enough money to retire. I would love to win an Academy Award, too. That's always been a dream. Yeah. But we'll yes. see. Yeah. Well, let's take us out, Priscilla. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Naveed, Absolutely. for being thank our you. guest. Naveed Macalari. Macalari. Say it. Tell me again. Uh, Macalari. Macalari. Yep. Mac allergy. Like metallurgy. Yeah. Okay. Mac allergy. Naveed Mac allergy. Okay. It's been wonderful having yeah, you. Yeah, really. Um, it's been a while since we've seen each other in person. I, I hope that it's not a while until we do again. So, but it's been great to have you on tonight. And to see You'll have to come out to a premiere of ours. Oh, I will definitely be there. Whatever premiere you've got, I'll be there. Yeah. Not to worry. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, All right, Bill. Nice to meet you. Thank Absolutely. you so much. All so the folks, best. All right. Bye, bye Priscilla. Thank you. Bye. So, bye, guys. Bye. Say good night to all our yeah. folks at home. So Let's say good night. Well. Yes. Okay. Well, until next time, this is Priscilla Almquist Olson and my co host here, Bill Ames, wishing you all the very best. Uh, and we'll see you at the movies. <laughs>